Hello, welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we uh, start the quick missions for um, for the Baltic campaign since I believe uh, it's been a little while but I believe we finished the single missions for the Baltic campaign because there are only three of them. So, uh, first up on the chopping block here is going to be these JS sorry, the JAS 39 Sob Griffin. And let's see if, uh... I wish this was a select box like, uh, aircraft was. Oh, there we go. So we're gonna be Swedish, Swedish here, uh, since that's actually the, the uh, country that, uh, makes it. Oh, they have, uh, Vegans and Drakens, too? Oh, we'll throw a little in there. Okay, so, um, the Sop Gripen is a lightweight multi-role fighter that uh, Sweden made uh, originally for itself, but it's uh, since seen a decent amount of uh, export success. Uh, it's akin to the F-16 in that it's a single-engine lightweight fighter with multi-role capabilities, but also similar to other European fighters like the Raphael and the Eurofighter in that it has a Delta design. And um, that's also in, more in line with the uh, previous Swedish aircraft, as we'll see in uh, once we get into the game a bit. So, Dragons, and then Biggins. So let's may oh reset it. Okay, so let's uh, Baltics. Set this back to Swedish, and that's actually not too far from where Sweden is, so it makes sense that they would uh, be able to commit a decent force to that area. So our enemy forces are, of course, going to be Russian. Let's make this something of a fair fight with uh, mm -hmm, MiG 29Ms. So they have some long-range capability. And then we'll give them some MiG-21s. And I don't know what the difference is between the two as far as the game is concerned, so we'll use a spread. Custom weapons loaded cores. We'll start 20 miles away. Neutral situation, uh, 20,000 feet. Uh, let's just do a bridge since we're going to be fairly low unavailable ordnance, so... Uh, Oh, this is probably decent. Yeah, we don't even need the fuel, really, so, uh... Just take a 2,000-pound bomb instead, and, uh... Who can we? Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> We'll take the 2,000-pounder, though. I like a big boom. So, uh, let's get up into the air. All right, everything's still working. Let's, uh, so there's our wing. These are the vegans, vigents. I don't know what the uh, correct term would be. Uh, I assume over the other way somewhere. There they are. Now these are the dragons, and the vigents and dragons are both Cold War air aircraft, I believe. Don't quote me on this, but I believe they were specialized as uh, interceptors, generally. And in fact, I believe one of them has the uh, the distinction of being one of the few aircraft who has successfully uh, intercepted a SR-71. So it's got that going for it. The Swedes actually, despite their small military, they make some decent stuff. And uh, if you're interested more, I believe there's a vegan model for uh, for uh, DCS. That's what it is. Yep. Uh, made by this Heapler, which is the same team that actually. Uh, 
made the F-14 module. Uh, all that. That sounded way too close. Alright, so it seems like uh, we've definitely got the edge here. Probably because Amram beats uh, Adder. Because the make 29 m should have been relatively equivalent to us. Oh, he's done for. Okay, so I think we can uh, move on to finding that bridge. And uh, I think first we'll, we'll hit it with a 2,000 pound bomb and follow up with Mavericks as necessary. Are they over here? Yes, they are. Alright. So while we're transiting to the area... So the brief overview of the Gryphon, besides what I've already said, is, um, you know, it's a Delta Wing fighter with can arts, much like contemporary European designs, with a relaxability design and fly-by-wire controls. And that relaxability design basically means it's not naturally stable, necessarily. I don't, uh, with this it might not be unstable, like I believe the F-16 is actually an unstable design that uses fly-by-wire computer controls to compensate for that so that way the pilot isn't spending his time you know trying to keep the aircraft steady and whatnot and in the air with the advantage of these unstable designs being much higher maneuverability but all right our bomb is away we'll stay above their low level defenses and um the aircraft is, of course, manufactured by Saab, which manufactures a lot of other things in um, Swedish industry. I know they do vehicles and such. Alright, mission accomplished, but uh, we got some ordnance to go through yet. And um, in order to leave, the fighter ended up being very successful in Swedish service, so they. Uh, Saab ended up forming partnerships with other companies like Bay Systems so they could market it internationally and it's seen a huge amount of success on the international um, in the international market too but for now um, and the only other thing of note really is that uh, there is a essentially a super version of the Gryphon um, the Gripen E is basically a redesign of the whole aircraft with additional digital controls, uh, integration, better integration with NATO systems, you know, the whole nine yards, so. But getting into a bit of the history now. Who's this joker who thinks he can target me? Me! Oh. No, it's not an SA-6, it's radar guided. Huh. I don't see him, but... In any case, in the late 70s, uh, Sweden sought to replace its SOP-35 Drakens and SOP-37 Vegans. And they wanted a Mach 2 aircraft that was affordable, good short range performance, good short field performance, because they have the, you know, being in Europe, uh, a big priority for a lot of European countries was they had to be take, able to take off on short or damaged runways, since, you know, being essentially on the front line with, um, with Russia, they could expect to take a decent beating, so... And I think, I want to say it's Sweden that actually has, like, air bases and tunnels and stuff where they just roll out of a mountain onto a road and take off. And, of course, um, a lot of countries, including Sweden, I believe, have the capability to use highways as improvised airfields for tactical aircraft. So, you know, all sorts of interesting preparations that you don't see in America. We got clipped there, I think, by the MG on the uh, 
BMP. Nothing major, though. But yeah, you just don't see that stuff in America. So it's always really interesting to see another country do it. But, um, so they began a study calling for a platform called the JAS, which stands for Dot Attacked Spumming uh, in Swedish, which uh, in English translates to air to air, air to surface, and reconnaissance, more or less. I mean, obviously, that's not a direct translation, but that's kind of what their acronym stood for there. Uh, so they wanted, you know, multi role fighter, essentially, what the U.S. has been doing more or less since the F 4 Phantom. And arguably, even before that, was some World War II aircraft. Clip, clip me with the machine. Alright, let's get that guy out of here. And I believe Saab was the only contender for this competition since they're really the only aircraft designer in Sweden. So they uh, they put forth several designs and Sweden chose what they considered to be the most promising one. Which uh, ended up being the Saab, or the Gripen that we know today. And uh, it was pretty revolutionary for its time, you know, with the fly-by-wire technology, the unstable design. Uh, the original power plant that they selected for the aircraft was the uh, Volvo Flickmotor RM12, which was basically a license-built uh, GE F404-400. But, um... They did have some issues with getting the um, weight down and to reduce the component count because they wanted a simpler engine to maintain and a lighter one too that wouldn't hamper the maneuverability as much or overburden the aircraft. And the uh, the Griffin name, which is actually Griffin in English, was. Uh, came from a public competition, so that's interesting, you know, that they involved their, uh, you know, their general public so much in military affairs. <laughs> you know, you don't, again, you don't really see that in the U.S. Uh, so, they wanted the Gripen, which is, uh, actually part of Sweden's logo, so. Now, the first prototype version was, uh, rolled out in April of 1987, so about eight to nine years after these requirements were, you know, were first devised. Uh, they did have a lot of issues with the fly-by-wire control system when it first came out. Not surprising, since fly-by-wire was a very new technology at the time, so it delayed the first flight by about a year and a half. And, um, eventually they, they weren't quite able to iron out all the issues, so eventually there was a crash in uh, February of 1989. What, oh, they're on a fuel already? Wow. Well, since I'm not irresponsible and I use my fuel, I suppose I can tell them to bug out. And there's nothing much left here. I'm a little disappointed they weren't more helpful in taking out some of these armored vehicles. But, um, there was a crash, um, which they identified afterwards as, um, um a pilot-induced oscillation in the, uh, control program, which was amplified by, uh, problems with their pitch control routine. The pilot survived, fortunately, just a broken elbow, but, uh... They ended up having to modify the software, which of course further delayed development and testing on the aircraft. And uh, actually, they they learned a bit from uh, their mistakes there. Okay, so we can head. Uh... Is that a course two seven zero? And that should bring us to the nearest Allied airbase. Now, they actually uh, contracted a U.S. firm called uh, Cavspan 
did come up with these software modifications, and they tested it first in a modified Lockheed NT-33A. So they were finally able to resume testing at about uh, 15 months after the accident. They did lose another production uh, production aircraft during a uh, flight show in uh, Stockholm, and the uh, the pilot survived, but uh, again, this was uh, the result of control issues. So, you know, basically, he was acting too fast for the system to really catch up. So that delayed things again. But um, as far as uh, But they finally got most of that worked out by December of 1993. So in uh, their first order, they made in uh, 1992, which included an option for 110 aircraft. Or actually, I take that back. I don't know how much their first order is, but this sounds like they made an order, and then th that order had an option for an additional 110 aircraft, and then they. Oh, here we go. The con first contract was five prototypes and an initial batch of 30 aircraft. So then that order also had a option for another 110 aircraft, which they then exercised in 1990. Yeah, June of 1992. Which, uh, this is, these aircraft are generally termed batch two aircraft. And they ordered 96 single-seat JAS 39As and 14 two-seat JAS 39B trainers. Excuse me. And it has the usual trainer modifications: longer fuselage, deletion of cannon, reduced internal field capacity to fit the person in. And uh, but this at this point they still hadn't selected a BVR missile to actually go with their aircraft, which is a bit of a thing but uh, they ended up ordering a third batch in June of 1997 composed of 50 upgraded JAS 39Cs and 14 JAS 39Ds trainers and this was known as the Turbo Gripen and this version had a lot of extra NATO compatibility built in for exports as well as their own uses Sweden uh, I think they're a part of NATO like 75 percent sure on that if they aren't i do know that they work very very closely with nato so it looks like we're a little off course here oh so that should bring us ah so we're landing at villainous and i think i see but it could be an airfield over there so uh, another feature of this new Turbo Gripen was um, was more powerful and updated avionics and flight refueling capability via retractable probes and an onboard oxygen generating system for longer missions. And uh, they ended up testing their in flight refueling capability with the Royal Air Force VC 10. And I believe Sweden doesn't have any native in flight tanker tanking refueling capabilities, so. That's why that was necessitated. So they ended up creating a joint venture company to manage the Gripen with base system Saab Bay Gripen AB. Uh, this was announced during the 1995 Paris Air Show. And the goal of this was to basically adapt the Gripen for the export market and to market it worldwide. So they. Uh, Converted the original, some of the original A and B aircraft to the upgraded C and D variants, uh, so that they were basically export ready. Since the A and Bs were somewhat limited in their original capabilities, and I believe this game mod models the uh, C variant. And um, so after that, they managed to get uh, quite a bit of. Uh, export success if I just fast forward here a little bit 
because they have uh, they've managed to sell it to Brazil, which that one they snatched up after that whole uh, scandal with uh, the U.S. government spying on <laughs> literally everyone. So that ended up being an easy sale for them in the end. Um, and they have orders for about 28. F-39E Grippins and 8 F-39Fs. I believe the F-39 is their designation with a total uh, potential of 72 E and F variants. Uh, the Czech Republic leases uh, 14 Grippins, 12 single C Cs and 2 Ds. Hungary operates uh, 12 Cs and 2 Ds as well on a lease to buy arrangement. South Africa actually ordered some, which is interesting since I know South Africa has made a big push, uh, made a big push to develop their own arms capability after they were um, embargoed during their apartheid era. Um, so they, I know they've heavily modified some of the original Israeli aircraft they built or that they acquired. Well, it's kind of surprising to see them. Uh, by aircraft from an outside source, but uh, in any case, they have 17 C's and 9 D's. Uh, Sweden itself operates 74 C's and 24 D's with um, 60 E's on order with 10 more planned uh, with an original order of 204 aircraft, and they, uh, they have them divided between three air wings. Uh, Thailand actually ordered some, which is interesting. I <laughs> since uh, they aren't aren't exactly rich. I mean, a lot of their military ends up uh, being spent on. Uh... So they a little background. They were the first comp the first country in Southeast Asia to operate an aircraft carrier since uh, the Japanese in World War II. Uh, they have an old, I believe it's. I want to say this one was actually built to their own design, but it's based on uh, it's based on NATO's uh, light sea control ship back from the 70s that ended up being modified and adapted by a bunch of different navies like Spain and Italy. And um, so they got their own version of that, which has basically served as a royal yacht because they had Harriers on it, but they only really use it to you know say be oh look we have a carrier and look the royal family's on it and then for disaster relief or they get hit by a you know a typhoon or something like that and uh, interestingly enough the UK also operates some Gripens with their uh, Empire Test Pilot School which they use for training but um it's been, and they've attempted to market this to even more countries, but so far that's all they've had success with. Now, there have been some scandals associated with the group, and one being that uh, Bay Systems was investigated for fraud and corruption in the uh, joint venture uh, that they were uh, a part of. Um, this was also... Uh, It was also not very popular among its citizenry because, you know, the, uh, the, its predecessor, the Biggin, which was less advanced and less expensive than the Gripen, was already derided as being too complex and too expensive, so, and that was, you know, a relatively cheap fighter even back in its day, so, you know, with them basically building their own F-16, yeah, the public and the left uh, weren't exactly thrilled with that. And there were a few bit of cost overruns too. In fact, it barely passed their, uh, in their government, it barely passed muster with uh, 176 for 167 against. But it finally made it through. Also, there was uh, allegations of bribery, so that's kind of reminiscent of the Lockheed scandal of, was it the 50s or 60s? Uh, basically, back then, um, Lockheed Martin was found to have bribed countries to, uh, to order its products, most notably uh, the Starfighter, which 
was notorious in Germany for uh, for because they didn't use it properly, and uh, so that crashed a lot. Now there is a more advanced variant of the grip in the um, the E and F variants. E is single seater, F is two seater. And this is basically equivalent to the Super Hornet versus the Legacy Hornet. You know, it's uh, completely rebuilt. And, uh, oh, Grand 8X compression there. And, like, you know, other 4.5 generation fighters, they got the whole, you know, 4.5 gen improvement kit. So the original ESO 5A radar was replaced by the Raven ESO 5, which was an electro active electronic scanning aperture radar. Um, or sorry, Array, uh, which is actually based on the Vixen Asa radars. You know, more fuel, more capacity. You know, in fact, the uh, its engine was a development of the General Electric 414G, which is uh, uh, adapted from the uh, Super Hornets engine. So, you know, glass cockpit, additional sensors, and Measures, you know, the whole 4.5 gen overhaul, and uh, this is the version that I believe is predominantly uh, operated today, and that's what they're improving on. Um, actually, I shouldn't say it's predominantly operated because the uh, the first flight was only completed on the 15th of June in 2017, and uh, as of May 2018 they were doing load tests so I think they're probably starting to enter service now but in moving numbers I think what did I say earlier they had like something like 60 so so uh, just some other areas of note um, is that in order to secure some of those uh, some of those export agreements they uh, they really push some uh, technology sharing um, agreements and basically what this means is all the tech that they use to build it they transfer it to the purchasing company uh, which uh, countries really like this because then they basically get tech without having to research it themselves so it's a lot cheaper and you see this as uh, it also gives some control over that technology too instead of being entirely reliant on whatever country they're buying from which is why you see a lot of independent countries starting to push that big time or you know even countries like i think for the lo a long time the u.s has insisted on whatever they buy uh foreign they get full control of the technology um india with their make in india program is insisting on uh foreign investment into their uh factories and such and locally producing it and and uh, transferring technology control to them. And part of that is just because they want to be able to reverse engineer it, maintain it themselves and not have to pay for it, but also um, have an understanding of everything in it because they don't want, you know, especially nowadays with how everything is so computerized, they don't want, you know, someone hiding an off switch in their equipment. You know, and that, I mean, that was a big thing during the Falklands War is there were reports that like the French gave these off switch codes to the Brits for the Exocet missiles and that the US gave them codes to shut down their A4s and stuff like that and obviously most of that isn't too true but uh, you know the best they could do is give them some inside information as to how they work best way to jam them that sort of thing but you know I think that possibility is even more real nowadays than it was God, that would have been uh, 38 years ago now I think um, so it's got the same hotas as that uh, most modern fighters have. Obviously, the uh, the newer Griffins have the you know full glass cockpit with uh, multifunction displays and excuse me. And uh, lately, they've been using the. Uh, Cobra helmet-mounted uh, display system, 
which is based on the Striker HMDS that's used on the Eurofighter, and that was developed by, again, the joint venture between Saab and Bay. Um, and again, the, uh, the base Grippens are powered by the General Electric F404, which is my locally built uh, licensed modified derivative, which they actually call the Volvo RM12. And then the, the E and F, the newer ones, adapted the uh, F4 and 4G. Ah, damn it, I keep getting that throttle. As far as equipment and armament, uh, the aircraft, at least the single seat versions, have a single integrated 27mm Mauser BK27 cannon. They can handle air to air missiles such as the M9 Sidewinder, interground missiles like the AGM 65 Maverick, and anti ship missiles like the RBS 15. And uh, with their MS-19 upgrade process, the, uh, they were able to get uh, longer range weapons including, and just more weapons in general, including the MBDA Meteor Missile, the Short Range Iris-T Missile, and the GBU-49 Laser Guided Bomb. And uh, part of their, as part of their export marketing, they basically said they're willing to integrate any weapon system with it. So. You know, if you want to use Israeli weapons, they'll modify it for you. If you want U.S. weapons, they'll modify it for you. So, you know, that's a really attractive option for uh, third-party countries that might want to be less reliant on Western technology. Um, an in-flight, it's capable of carrying up to about 6,500 kilograms of armament and equipment. And some of the equipment can include external sensor pods, recon pods, targeting designators like Raphael's lightning pod. Uh, Saab's got their own module reconnaissance pod. Thales has a digital reconnaissance pod. Um, it's got its own integrated electronic warfare suit, like most modern fighters do. A missile approach warning system. And uh, they've recently been working on enhancing that electronic warfare suite to provide uh, increased defenses against modern threats. And, uh, and, uh, some of the interesting notes about the Gripen is that because it was designed to basically fly defensively, uh, in defense of Sweden from Russian invasion, you know, not only did it have to operate from short runways, but snow-covered runways, uh, they had to take off in less than 800 meters, and they had to have a turnaround time of just 10 minutes, in which one technician and five conscripts should have been able to rearm refuel and perform basic inspections and servicing, which is a uh, really optimistic target. Um, I kind of want to see the data on uh, what they were actually able to do. Because when you say conscript, I think average army grunt, you know? And I don't see them being able to do an inspection real well. Not that they can, it's just it's not something they're really going to be covered in have covered in basic training, I think. You know, so Sweden's been the primary user, of course. Um, and obviously they haven't done much other than basic air patrols and air policing. Czech Republic, they're probably the next biggest user. Uh, they've got some to replace their MiG-21s, but again, um, haven't done much other than, you know, air patrols, air policing, Hungary, another NATO country that uh, got the Gripen as a low-cost replacement for uh, its old Warsaw Pact fighters. Um, again, air patrols, air policing, something really notable. Uh, South Africa uh, bought some, but uh, they've been having trouble keeping them all flying because they've had some budgetary issues as of late. Thailand, um, as a small number, uh, they originally talked about ordering as much as 40, but I imagine uh, they've had budgetary issues. And then I know there was that whole, like, coup going on in their... Aren't they under a military dictatorship now still? So, but I'm sure that may have hampered talks in getting more of the Griffins and probably focusing more on uh, policing and, and uh, counterinsurgency at this point. And then, obviously, uh, Brazil got a sweet deal on those. And they've tried marketing it to other countries too. Botswana, Canada, Colombia, Croatia, Finland, India, Indonesia, Philippines. 
and uh, they lost bids in Bulgaria, Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Slovakia, and Switzerland. Excuse me. So that is more or less the long and short of that. So, um, I did find it interesting that uh, there's no mention of AMRAM compatibility. I'm kind of curious of that now, so I'm going to look that up. Because obviously the AMRAM is, other than the, uh, the one, there's a, a French air to air missile, but there wasn't, uh, there wasn't really that many of them as I recall. Uh, I need a bigger desk, but uh, let's look at potential loadouts for, all right, so it looks like the JAS-39E and F have an in-service date of uh, 2019. We have Meteor, Iris T, Maverick. Oh, they do not have AMRAMs. Okay, so that's a bit, uh, a little unrealistic of the game, but I suppose they didn't want to have to model another weapon, and it's just as well we ended up using the AMRAMs a lot, so. And there have been a couple proposals for variants, uh, an aggressor version, which would be used more for training so it would be uh, weaponless but more maneuverable. Um, the Gripen M which was a proposed carrier based version of the uh, Gripen Next Generation I think it was Gripen NG which is basically the Gripen E and F. Uh, they were proposing it to Brazil and India but they uh, I don't think that ever really uh, got anywhere because God knows Bra Brazil doesn't have the money for its carrier really anymore, and uh, uh, I think India bought some uh, stabilized MiG-29s, if I'm not mistaken. The uh, MiG-29K, I believe. Uh, there's and talk of converting it to an unmanned combat aerial vehicle to grip in UCAV, so uh, depending on the funding for that, that could be one of the first uh, test beds for uh, or uh, UCAP based on a manned fighter. I think it's going to be that or the uh, F-16. Since they've already got F-16 target drones, so they're kind of already halfway there. You just got to put a smart control system in it now. And uh, the last proposed variant has been the Gripen EW, which would have been uh, akin to the Super Hornet's Growler, uh, where it would have been a uh, variant designed for electronic warfare, so it would have been based off the Gripen F with additional electronic warfare measures, but so far that's gone nowhere, so. So yeah, that's about it. Combat range, about 500 miles. Ferry range, 2,000 miles. Rest of weight is 0.97, a little low, but um, I think most fighters of this class generally manage to get above one, so that's a little interesting, but that might be uh, because of some of their constraints and having to make it take off at sh such a short distance and um, So it might have needed some strengthening for that Which might be why they were so uh, Willing to convert it to a carrier version too Oh here and that's interesting here it does say it is capable of uh, uh, Being armed with the AMRAM apparently the Swedish designation is the RB-99 I wonder is the RB-74. Also uses the A-Darter, which is, I believe, a South African air-to-air uh, -air missile. AEPD.350. I'm not familiar with that one. But yeah, can carry four rocket pods, uh, six IRST or Sidewinders or A-Darters, four Meteors, Micas, or AMRAMs, four Mavericks, or UK EPD-350s, or two RBS-15 updated ship missiles. Bombs that could carry up to four Paveway 2s or two BK-90 cluster bombs or eight Mark 82 uh, 500 pound bombs, so pretty uh, pretty versatile. And that's actually the uh, C variant. The E variant obviously has better stats with a uh, um, combat range of 930 miles, so almost double that of the uh, of the Ribbon C, ferry range of 2,500 miles, 
thrust away at 1.04, so they finally broke that uh, that 1.0, so they can accelerate and climb straight up. Uh, and they get boosted up to 10 hard points, so we're on the fuselage, two under each wing and one on the tip of each wing. Uh, one's dedicated for a FLIR pod, but they can carry most of the same weapons. Rocket pods, IRST, Sidewinder, Adarder, Meteor, Amram, Mica, Maverick, KEPD-350, RBS-15F, but they do have an expanded um, retinue bombs with Paveway 2s, BK-90 cluster bombs, Smart Daddy 2s, GBU-39 small diameter bombs, or alternative small diameter glide bombs. So yeah, that's, uh, I think that about does it for uh, this aircraft, so let's go on to our briefing now. Alright, we successfully completed the quick mission. Uh, we destroyed all 16 targets, we took 5% damage because of the uh, heavy MGs from the ground, but it didn't do much to us. Uh, they just clipped us. Wingmen were fine. So we had four fighter kills, so Wingman 1's 2. We had two SAM kills, two AAA kills, two tank kills, well, APC kills, uh, six trucks and a bridge, and then our first Wingman just had the two fighters and the two vehicles, so... I will say I was a bit surprised. I expected the uh, air battle to be a bit tougher, but uh, it ended up being really easy. Most of our missiles hit, looks like four hit, one failed, one was spoofed, I presume. I would like to presume the fail was just because someone else stole my kill. Uh, looks like our wingman, all of his missiles hit. Uh, all of our air to ground launches hit. Our bomb hit. We had a decent hit percentage on our gun. And there were only two air to air missiles fired on us, we spoofed them. Two SAM launches on us, we spoofed, and then only 4% trip away. So, all in all, it was a pretty good run. And uh, I think it showed how capable Swedish aircraft are, because I think they're forgotten a lot when people think of NATO. But uh, I'm for pound. I think they're well above average in terms of their fighting strength. So uh, yeah, I think this really helps showcase that. In any case, I think this will uh, conclude our episode for today. Hopefully these will be occurring more frequently again as, we, uh, as things start to kind of... Uh, here up at work hopefully um actually uh i had planned on being vacation this week but instead i'm working from home in quarantine again so yeah i'll take what i can get so but in any case thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there and we'll see you then